In November of 1847, a Presbyterian mission near Walla Walla was attacked by Cayuse Indians. The Cayuse had been decimated by a measles outbreak, and they blamed the missionaries. The result was 13 dead American settlers, and as many as 50 more taken captive. The event became known as the Whitman Massacre, and it so shocked the nation that President James K. Polk and Congress rushed to approve the official formation of Oregon Territory in 1848. The provisional government in Oregon raised a volunteer militia called the Oregon Rifles and dispatched them to the Dalles to protect the Methodist mission there. From the Dalles, columns of men marched east to rescue the Americans held captive and to punish the Cayuse for the massacre. The Cayuse War lasted from 1847 to 1850. Among the Oregon Rifles volunteers was a man by the name of Andrew Jackson Bowen. Andrew Bowen would distinguish himself during these campaigns and his reputation would grow. Washington Territory would be formed out of Oregon in 1853 and a new governor would make his way from the east, surveying the land for a future rail line along the way. Governor Isaac Stevens would also carry the title Superintendent of Indian Affairs and would immediately set out to induce the various Indian tribes into signing treaties, extinguishing title to vast lands and confining their holdings to reservations. By then, Andrew Bolin was a member of the first Washington Territorial Legislature, representing Clark County. It was there that he met Governor Stevens and the governor's 12-year-old son, Hazard. The governor was impressed with Bolin, and he made him an officer in the Volunteer Army, and then commissioned him as a federal law enforcement officer. Major Andrew Bolin was now also an Indian agent. During 1854 and 55, Bolin would embark on multiple journeys and meet with the tribal chiefs to establish diplomatic relations. It was during that time that Bolin met Yakima Chiefs Kamayakan and his uncle, Chief Auhai, as well as lesser nobles among the Yakima, such as Qualchan, Shumaway, and his son, Moshiel. Of these men, according to the whites, Kamayakan would eventually emerge as the recognized leader of the Yakima peoples. Kamayakan was a complex man, tall and muscular and universally regarded as handsome by the whites who had met him. He was initially welcoming and friendly to both Hudson's Bay men as well as the Bostons, as the American settlers were known to the Indians. He had known the Whitmans, and he recognized the importance of knowing the ways of the white man. He asked Whitman to come to the Yakima Nation and open a mission there as well, but they had declined. He later met two French Catholic missionaries, Father Pandosi and Father Chiruze, who had arrived in Walla Walla in October of 1847, and he invited them to come to the Yakima Valley instead. The following month was the Whitman Massacre. It was Father Pandosi that convinced Kamayakan to stay neutral during the Cayuse War. The two priests accepted Kamayakan's invitation and they opened a mission in the lower Yakima Valley in 1849. Kamayakan would eventually come to believe in the message that the missionaries brought, and he eventually had his entire family baptized in the Catholic faith. With the notable exception among the Indian baptized was Kamayakan himself. He had five wives, and he wasn't ready to trade them in for the salvation promised by the priests. Kamayakan saw more and more Americans coming through Yakima lands. He welcomed a wagon train led by James Longmire in 1853, and provisioned them for their trek over Natchez Pass. He hosted then-Captain George McClellan, later a famous Civil War general, when his survey party passed through. McClellan and his men described Kamayakan as generous and honest, friendly and well-disposed, and imbued with an honesty not often found. But as more and more Americans flooded into the territory, Kamayakan grew suspicious of their true intentions. He took counsel with Father Pandosi, who confessed to him that what he was witnessing was just the beginning. In the spring of 1855, Kamayakan called the tribes from far and wide to a secret council meeting in the Grand Ronde River Valley, deep in the Blue Mountains. Although some Nez Perce answered the call, one holdout of note was their principal chief, 
a man named Lawyer. Lawyer sent word ahead that he would have no part in Kamayakin's plans, lest their fate become the same as that of the dreaded Cayuse. The talk would be nothing particularly new. Rumblings and discussions of going to war with the Whites had been ongoing for years. But for Kamayakin, it was time for more than just talk. It was time to confederate. It was time to plan. It was decided that the Indians would ready for a fight. Kamayakin, although determined to go to war, if necessary, urged patience. The war against the Americans would need to begin in winter, when the mountain passes were covered in snow and the rivers were frozen over, hampering them from sending reinforcements from west of the mountains. The chiefs agree and return to their homelands to begin the process of provisioning for inevitable war. When Bolin and his superior, Agent James Doty, met Kamayakin in the Yakima Valley later in the spring of 1855, they tried to convince him to sell his lands to the Whites. He angrily refused to speak until the final day of negotiations, entering the tent armed to the teeth and ready to attack if the white men persisted. In the end, Bolin was able to convince Kamayakin to agree to meet with Governor Stevens to negotiate. But Kamayakin insisted that the meeting would take place at Walla Walla with other tribes. Treaty negotiations known as the Walla Walla Council were held in late May and early June of 1855. When Kamayakin arrived there, he noticed large numbers of Nez Perce present, which aroused his suspicions. He learned later in face-to-face -face discussions with Governor Stevens that he had been betrayed by Lawyer, the chief of the Nez Perce. Stevens told Kamayakin that he knew of their Grand Ronde Council and about the plans they had laid. News of this disheartened many of the chiefs at the council, and nearly all of them agreed to sign the treaty that day, forfeiting most of their lands to the United States and confining themselves to reservations. Kamayakin was the last holdout. Isaac Stevens threatened Kamayakin, telling him that if he refused, his lands would run knee-deep with blood. And finally, his mind unchanged about the plans that had been laid, and wanting to avoid a premature war, he signed the treaty with the comment, for all the good it will do. Many of the Americans were convinced that peace had been secured, while some felt Kamayakin was just stalling for time so he could prepare for war. Some of the Indians were demoralized, but not Kamayakin and the Yakima. They would steal themselves for the coming winter. Hi there, and I hope you enjoyed that second video, which kind of introduces you to Kamayakin and, and explains a little bit more about who Andrew Bullen was. Um, Concerning Bolin, my research, I was never that impressed with the title Indian agent. I kind of drew an equivalent with the police officer. But as I've looked into things, it's really a lot more important of a position than that. Um, it's the 1850s equivalent of, a, of at least a G-man. I mean, it really, they were the only federal officers other than marshals that are out there. And when they appoint a governor to a territory... That's why they give him this other title, Superintendent of Indian Affairs, because it quite literally is the it's the number one diplomatic job that they have is relationships with the Indian tribes. So to be an Indian agent was a big deal. And that kind of makes sense now, because uh, when you realize that Andrew Bullen was actually the one of the first delegates to the territorial legislature representing Clark County, um, tells me at least that he was a man of stature he wasn't he wasn't just a nobody so when he got killed it was a very big deal all right other than that uh james doty his immediate supervisor had some uh trouble trying to figure out who he was um but i did track him down this man used to be the territorial governor of wisconsin before he came out here um and so he was he was a very knowledgeable man he might have been vying for the governorship for all i know because when he was done out here doing what he did, and he was actually going into to wigwams with, with Bolin, walking into Kamayakin's house and talking to him. I mean, it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, but when he was done out here in Washington, he actually became governor again, uh, this time of Utah Territory. So can't believe there's not more about this guy because he's, uh, 
I mean, in the first case, he was uh, appointed by, I mean, a territorial governor is appointed by a president. Um, in the second case, when he went to Utah, he was appointed by uh, Abraham Lincoln himself. So pretty impressive guy. Uh, now, concerning Kamiakin, um, if, you, if you're getting the idea, this was a pretty interesting guy. And, and I, there's a whole lot of detail that I just can't get into in these vignettes, but it's super interesting. Um, it's quite literally a non-fictional Game of Thrones that was going on in Yakima. And, and I'm just not going to do that to you with these, you know, trying to keep it under 10 minutes for these videos right now. Um, that'll be stuff for the full documentary. And, and as far as that goes, you know, I would be outside filming this piece right now, explaining this to you. I'd, I'd kind of set up, talk about the last piece. I'm going to set up the next one that you're about to watch. And, and I would be doing that with help and be outdoors in some setting. I'd go somewhere for it. But right now the weather hasn't cooperated. So this is, uh, this is as good as it's going to get right now. And I just wanted to get my own face back on camera so I can maintain ownership of my project here. But as far as Kamayakin goes, you need to just understand this one thing, that his, his leadership of the Yakima tribe was certainly not a unanimous thing. Um, he didn't have the lineage for it. His, his father was actually a Palouse Indian, not a Yakima. Now, his mother was in the right bloodline. Um, they had some big chief, uh, Wheel Witch, they called him, that, that had lived. He, I don't know if he's still living during this time. He's never mentioned. Uh, or, or maybe he was just old and, and, and decrepit at that point. But in any event, Kamayakin's mother uh, was from that bloodline. Um, but Auhai's father was, and so was uh, uh, Shumaways, sometimes called Showaway. Uh, they were both the, the sons of this guy. So that actually put both of these two ahead of Kamayakin on that, on that ladder to the leadership of the tribe. But Kamayakin kind of usurp, usurped power, but not violently or anything. He just did it through character, and people um, wanted to follow him because he, he's a big man. He's about six foot and muscular, uh, chiseled face, and, and the way he carried himself was apparently uh, um, something to behold. Um, I only touched on it briefly as far as George McClellan, what his thoughts were. Um, but on that note with McClellan, uh, that happened in uh, 1853, and, and um, this wasn't just a small thing for, for Kamayakin. McClellan um, and his mission, he was working for, uh, for Stevens coming over to survey for railroad, railroad routes, and this was a military caravan. This wasn't just a bunch of haggard-looking settlers coming through. And seeing the military in strength, this was the first time for Kamayak, and it really shook him and helped shape his opinions as he went into these councils and uh, the the secret one in the Blue Mountains and then going to the Walla Walla Council and meeting with Stevens. It kind of set him um, on a new path as far as what he believed was going to happen and what he had to do about things. But concerning the support from the rest of the tribe, there's people in the tribe that supported him based upon his leadership, but didn't agree with some of the things uh, that he was aiming to do. For instance, um, a lot of the people who supported him because he was a strong leader didn't want to go to war in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Kamayankum was kind of in the middle, but then you had this other group that supported him that, that wanted to go kill every white person that even set foot on Yakima lands. Um, and then on the other hand, you had uh, support for Auhai, who... Um, they supported him based upon bloodline alone, and then, but they might not have agreed with him because out of the two of them, Alhai was a pacifist. You'll be hearing a little bit more about that in the future, but um, kind of an interesting set of circumstances, and, and it sets the stage for once the battles start going and you get a little bit of back and forth, um, win some, lose some, um, things get a little bit strange in the Yakima, and, and there's a whole lot of drama. That's part. It's only one part of this huge story from 1853 to 1858 that, that, um, that believe me, there's a whole lot of meat to chew on as far as uh, a documentary, and I would only hope one day uh, professionally produced drama, not by me, um, somebody, hey, Ron Howard or Tom Hanks, if you're listening, let's get behind this thing because it would make one heck of a television series or show. I think it's too much for a movie, but maybe a series of movies. But in any event, that's where uh, I'm hoping to go with this thing. Um, all right, that's setting you up for this next one, and I uh, hope you enjoy. This one is um, going to be all about Andrew Boland's demise and what happened after that. <laughs> 